At the beginning of this century, there was no living European who had seen Lhasa, this forbidden city of Tibet. Foreigners were not welcome. Tibet was one of the last secret places on Earth, a mystery that the 19th century had left for the 20th to explore. It was their Buddhist religion the Tibetans wished to preserve from outside influences. This and their fragile independence. Like a no man's land behind the Himalayas, Tibet kept apart three empires. To the south was British India. To the west, the expanding Russian Empire. To the east and north, Imperial China. The Chinese had always claimed Tibet to be part of China a claim they had only rarely been able to enforce. In the 1930s and 40s, a few outsiders had visited Tibet, mostly British political representatives come up from India. These pictures from the films they took reveal Tibet as a medieval country, devoted to its spiritual and earthly leader, the Dalai Lama. British in India, Tibet had been a convenient buffer along the northern frontier of the empire. Tibet's isolation had served the British well, but by 1950, the British had left India. The last British representative was gone from Lhasa. The garden parties of the Dekilinka, where the British had stayed, were but a memory. There was a new world order now. In China, racked by war since the founding of the Republic in 1911, Mao's forces had finally triumphed. The Communists were now ready to enforce the old claim that Tibet was part of China. In Peking, they solemnly declared that Tibet was next to be liberated. Is today just one European, an Austrian, who had first-hand experience of what happened in Lhasa in the last days of 1950. I had been living in Lhasa for five happy years. After escaping from a British internment camp in India, together with Peter Aufschneider, we had reached Lhasa, became employees of the Tibetan government. I also became friend of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. By 1949, the Chinese threatened Tibet with what they called liberation. Everybody in Lhasa knew that the Chinese were going to carry out this threat. The Tibetans loved their independence and were clearly entitled to enjoy it. They had no wish to be liberated. The little Tibetan army was hurriedly reorganized under the supervision of a cabinet minister. Monks and officials were trained as officers. New regiments were raised and the richer classes called upon to furnish and equip another thousand men. Not only the material means of defense were mobilized, but also the spiritual forces of the people. Religion, the most powerful element in the life of the country, had to be invoked. All the monks in Tibet were ordered to attend public services. Offerings were doubled, rare and powerful amulets brought out of old chests. Meanwhile, Radio Peking was already sending out messages in Tibetan, promising that Tibet would soon be freed. As the threat of liberation grew, it seemed as if the entire population of Tibet had packed the narrow streets of Lhasa in pious enthusiasm for the religious festivals, which in 1950 surpassed in pomp and splendor anything I had ever seen. Despite the threat from the Chinese, the ceremonies vital to the running of the state had to continue. 
four weeks after the great New Year festival, the 20,000 monks of the monasteries around Lhasa descended once again into the city for the second prayer festival. The people believed with rock-like faith that the power of religion would suffice to protect their independence. On October the 7th, 1950, the Chinese attacked the Tibetan frontier in six places simultaneously and swept aside the little Tibetan army. Should the Dalai Lama stay or flee? The Tibetan government could not make such an important decision. The gods must have the last word. The state oracle said, flee. I felt like a spectator at a play who foresaw the tragic denouement and was saddened by the inevitable end, but had to sudden had rung down on feudalism, and they knew it. They headed southwards across the Tsangpo River along the old trade route to India. News of the Dalai Lama's approach soon reached the Tibetan town of Gyantse. Small white stones were laid along the sides of the streets to ward off evil spirits. Incense fires burned in welcome. Monks and nuns flocked from the monasteries and convents, and the whole population waited for hours to receive their king and beg him not to leave them. Every place in which the Dalai Lama spent a night was automatically consecrated as a chapel. The party carried on across the Himalayas towards India. I saw the young god king riding slowly by on his grey horse. The enemy was in the land and the ruler's flight was only the first step towards greater misfortunes. Sixteen days after leaving Lhasa, the caravan halted in the Chumbi Valley on the borders of India. I stayed with His Holiness in the Chumbi Valley for three more months, still believing that we might be able to return to Tibet, that the world would listen uh, to the cries of Tibet to stay as an independent country. But then I realized it was the end of uh, the old uh, Tibet, so I said goodbye to the Dalai Lama. Now a communist country was occupying their home, so my sadness was, of course, very, very great because I knew that I won't ever see my friends in Tibet again.